you know, you think about the, the corporate pyramid and everybody goes, oh, you know, want to be at the top of the pyramid, right? The CEO. And, you know, even, even with my team now, you know, I told them right off the bat, I said, I'm not sitting up there. I'm at the bottom. I like being able to help push people forward. Welcome to Rochester Business Connections, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC, where I get the chance to chat with Rochester, New York's very best business owners, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. I am your host, Ben Albert. Don't forget to subscribe. And remember, we don't do advertisements. My fee for this show is simple. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Let's get started. I am here with Bob Russell. Bob, what's up? How are you today? I'm doing fantastic, Ben. How's everything? It's it's good. Um, this won't come out for a few weeks, so I thought about not even mentioning it, but we might as well address it because you and I were joking about it. Yeah, uh, I'm in like Cabo or something <laughs> right now, but it's a green screen. Realistically, we've got snow in Rochester and it's almost May. So what's going on, man? April snow. You can't beat it. You know, <laughs> it, it just goes to show Rochester changes every minute. It, it really does. The, Rochester is unpredictable. It's one thing I love about it. Um, Bob, you have a real decorated history in Western New York. Currently, you're the CEO of Rochester Hearing Center. Is it Hearing and Learning Center? Did I get it right? Hearing and Speech Center. Got it. I knew I got it wrong. <laughs> Rochester Hearing and Speech Center. You're the CEO and very decorated past. And we'll, we'll dive deep and talk about a few things, but let's get started. If you're under a rock and you haven't heard of Rochester Hearing, it, you guys have been around like a hundred years, right? Yeah, actually 2022 over our hundredth year. So we're wow. still a baby at 99. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the agency has such a long history uh, here in town and just the number of people over the years that you know we've been able to serve. Uh, we are a not-for-profit agency. Uh, we're part of the El Siegel uh, family of agencies as well, one of the founding members of that. And the, the amazing thing over all these years is really the mission has not changed. And, and that's serving our community, both from a hearing uh, standpoint for people that are dealing, dealing with hearing issues and audiology, but also serving a younger population, preschool age with early childhood intervention, offering speech therapy, uh, physical therapy. So we, we really, we say our clientele is from newborn to seniors. And it, it's been amazing that with the long a history of the organization that that has not changed. And, and the need is still there, if not even greater today than it was when we were first founded. Well, and anyone from newborn to seniors, I know personally, I had a speech impediment when I was younger and I still kind of have a speech impediment because there is, you know, saying R's and um, a little bit of a mumbler. So if you're a a young adult or a child, ultimately you can help them. And then obviously in the later years, um, whether it's for hearing or speech, it, wow. So there's programs for, for all types of Rochesterians. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that led me to this organization was my, my own personal journey. Uh, I suffered from a speech impairment when I was a child and I also lost hearing. So I kind of hit both sides of it. And then as a parent, uh, you know, my daughter was born prematurely. So we had to go through all of the occupational therapy and the physical therapy with her as well. And it really gave me an understanding of being on both ends of the spectrum of what we do. And, you know, most people think of hearing loss as, you know, when people become seniors, which is a big part of it. But there's also a whole population right now, uh, globally, the largest population that's growing in hearing issues is the 30 and under population. And I think a lot of it, you know, we're all wearing headphones now. Uh, you know, we have our music on our phones and, you know, some, some people that I know, they've got headphones in for 10 hours a day and it just starts to take its toll after a while. So, you know, what we're looking at is, you know, where is the need now, but we're also looking ahead who is going to have the need five years from now and 10 years from now so that we make sure that we're reaching them at this point uh, to let them know, you know, what options they have, especially for hearing conservation and being able, because 
you know, once you lose your hearing, it, 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 it can't be reversed. So the more that we can do working and helping people now to sustain it is really what the biggest goal is. I love that you talk about sustainability, hearing conservation. That's a term, hearing conservation. I'd never heard that term before. And you're Mm -hmm. talking from someone who is just a huge music advocate, has a music podcast, goes to concerts, and sometimes is standing right next to that speaker. (sighs) Maybe that's not the right choice. Uh, I'm curious, other than something that's obvious that you shouldn't be standing next to a speaker at a rock concert multiple days a week, what what things can we do today to help with our hearing conservation? Maybe we haven't started to lose our hearing, or maybe we have and we don't even know it yet. Is there anything a young adult like me can do to, to avoid this nightmare that could occur? Yeah, you just hit the nail on the head we don't realize it. Mm. And I'd say that's 90% of the people that walk through our doors is they go, well, I don't think I have a hearing problem, but you know, my spouse or my parent or my child, you know, thinks we do. And I think one of the things for us, that's really important. uh, Dr. Greg Horton, who is our director of audiology, Greg's also a musician. So he's been working for years about the importance of hearing conservation working with musicians that travel from all over to come to Rochester to see him being able to get custom ear molds done. Um, but there's, there's a lot of things. I mean, the obvious first step is the volume level that there is. And then it's really about the association. And it's not even just for people that are listening to music, but it could be somebody who lives in a high or works in a high risk industry. You know, maybe they're working in a, a machine shop or a factory, or they're a, a tradesperson who's around a lot of loud noises. After a while, it just keeps taking its toll. And again, we as people don't realize it. Um, you know, for me, it was, why are you talking so loud all the time? And I'm like, I'm not talking loud. I didn't realize it. <laughs> those around me did. And, and, you know, that after you start hearing it a while over and over again from people, you go like, uh, maybe it is something that I should have checked out. And uh, that, that's a big part of the work that we do is just, you know, bring people in very non-threatening environment, but just doing, you know, basic hearing tests with them to let them see what their levels are, uh, where they're at, and then be able to gauge that uh, moving forward. So whether it's a year from now or two years from now that they come back and trying to work with them on here's ways that you can really take care of your hearing. Um, we're in the midst of doing a pilot program on a, on a, a what word do I want to use, on a program where basically on an iPad, we're able to go in and put in the results of somebody's hearing test. And then we take that and we play back music. We play back conversation, but we're not playing it for them. We're playing it for their family members and saying, this is what they're actually hearing. Hmm. And they had people don't have any idea, you know, what it's like to be in that other world. Um, now, all of a sudden, they're getting a taste of that. And, you know, I, I've gone through it with elderly family members where you realize, oh, my God, what have they been missing all these years? You know, not being able to hear their grandchildren tell them that they love them. Mm. And they hear they see them saying something and they smile, but they're not taking that in, they're not hearing it. And and it's really about quality of life for people. And like I said, you know, especially with a younger audience, especially somebody like you, right? You're around music all the time, love concerts. I'm the same way. After a while, it just has a permanent effect. And we want to make sure that you're going to be able to enjoy this for many, many years without having any issues. I, I, I don't know if it's goosebumps or what's going on in my body, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm wondering now, cause it started to come to the forefront. Um, I didn't even know I was going to be talking about this, Bob, but it started to come to the forefront for me in the fact everyone's wearing masks and I like to look someone in the eyes and pay attention mm-hmm. to their body language. And now I'm on zoom a lot. And then when I'm not, they're wearing masks and I almost feel like Maybe since I'm not lip reading, I can't hear them as well, but I actually almost think with the muffling of the mask and not being able to hear their, see their lips, my girlfriend's giving me a hard time all the time that I just don't seem to have hearing. Now, hopefully I'm fine. 
how does someone like me get, get a test? Like, can I just come in and get tested? How does all that work? How can I be proactive, figure out where my baseline is now and make sure it doesn't get any worse? Yeah. And, and I want to tell you, what you just mentioned is one of the biggest challenges that there's been uh, since the pandemic started with people wearing masks because you don't have as clear of an understanding. And I think that's led a lot of people to go like, oh, maybe there is an issue. Um, it's very simple. You know, we've got three locations uh, in Brighton, Greece, and Webster, and people can just call and set up an appointment with one of our doctors of audiology to be able to come in and get their testing done. And, you know, from there, it's not just because we're a not for profit, we're trying to serve the individual needs of each client. So, you know, we don't have certain models of hearing aids that we're trying to push, or we don't have um, goals of number of sales that we have to have for our audiologists each month. It's about addressing each person individually. And what we'll do is be able, once the testing is done, our staff will go through each aspect of it. And talk to people like, well, it seems like, you know, you have more trouble trying to hear high end noises or low end noises. And then, you know, if there is a need for a hearing device, what's the best device for the person? Uh, It's not that, you know, we're going to put everybody into the Porsche of hearing aids if they don't need that. You know, it's really individualized, the care that we give. And I think that's what's helped us to build our reputation and really what sets us apart from, you know, some of the, I'll say the word competition, even though there's not for us as a type of agency we are, there's not a lot of competition, but it's really about that personalized care for somebody and and not giving them something just to make them feel like they're being helped with, you know, new technology, but really finding out what it is that it that is the biggest area uh, that they're suffering from. And and how do we help them again, maintain that and not have it get any worse at this point. Yeah. I I like that you talk about, you know, your competition, but not really your competition. And I'm almost a broken record because I say it all the time. The only mistake you can make is not seek help when you need it in any area of life. And then it gets down to the point, okay, there's a competitive market it sounds like you guys, ultimately, you're not focused on sales. You're not focused on yeah. metrics other than the satisfaction of your customers as a huge metric. So I know that if I come in, I'll be treated great. And we've talked a lot about hearing, whether it's speech or anything else. What, what other problems do you see often that we might not realize we have or we know we have? And this is just bringing it to the forefront. Yeah, well, I think a lot of it is the stigma, right? For somebody to walk through your door, they have to admit that they might have a problem. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people don't like to admit those things, you know, especially, you know, guys like us, right? We're independent and we we know it all. And we know, talk us, loud. We talk loud. You know, I always tell people, I'm Italian. I always have to talk loud, <laughs> it's just in my DNA. Um, but but it's really letting people know that, you know, there, there's no issue in recognizing, you know, that, that there might be a problem, just like, you know, we have to listen to our own bodies. You know, I, I, I've always said, you know, I can't leave it to my doctor to tell me, I think there's something wrong. I need to let him know when something doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. And it's the same area with, you know, with hearing and with speech is there's nothing that's taboo about it. I mean, we have a president of the United States who had a very bad speech impairment uh, as a child. You know, and, and I, I like to look at people like that as beacons of hope for others, that it's not something you have to be ashamed of, mm-hmm. but just being able to help understand what the situation is and what you can do to try and help with it. Um, it's really interesting with, you know, a lot of our younger kids, because some that are coming in, you know, they, they haven't developed speech patterns yet. And, that, and that's part of what the situation is. And it's really just having the patience, but also the understanding for the families who are taking that journey along with them about here's ways that we're going to help, but how you can also help them every day. Um, I say as a, as a parent, to me, there would be nothing worse than either my child not being able to hear me say I love you or me not being able to hear them say that to me. And this is what we're here to do. It's about quality of life, helping people, and letting them know there's ways to be able to work with any impairment you might have and, and really being able to trust 
the professionals that we have uh, that have been working with people. I mean, we, we have members of our, our um, early childhood staff that have been with us for 30 years, you know, and kids that they worked with who are now college graduates, yeah. you know, with multiple degrees. And it's just such a great feel good. Um, you know, we have three generations of families that have been using our products and services that we're serving throughout each generation. And it's just a wonderful story to be able to tell and to share with people, but there's always hope. And that's, that's the biggest thing I tell people. Don't feel that there's not hope to be able to help you. That's what we do. That's what our mission is. That's why the people that work for us, we work in not-for-profit. We're not there to get rich, but we're there to enrich lives. And in turn, we get that back ourselves. We know every day when we wake up that we're changing people's lives with the work that we're doing. And I can't ask for anything more than that. Mm, yeah. I I want to get more into business in a moment. But while we're on this, what's the best way to reach out? Before we digress into something different, the website, email, Facebook, where should I go to gain more information on the topic or even just call up and, and make an appointment today? Yeah, we have a really robust robust website. It's uh, rhsc.org, and there's information in there about all of the different programs that we have, the services. We have our contact information for our three offices. So again, it's wherever somebody, what's closest for them, what's more convenient. Um, And the great thing, though, is we also have testimonials. So we kind of tell people, like, you don't have to take our word for it where you think we're just saying it because we work for the organization, but take it from the people that have used our services, people that come to us for help um, and and what we've been able to do to help them with their lives. So the website's the best first place to start. We also have a Facebook presence, Instagram, and you know it's not all for us, especially social media about, hey, here's what we're doing, look what we're doing. It's about the issues. We're trying to help educate people about hearing. For instance, you know, May is uh, International Hearing uh, Month. So there's a lot of things that we're doing just around the topic. Uh, We currently have on our Facebook page, we've got some, you know, trivia quizzes Mm. to see how much people know. Uh, And then we're posting the the answers a little later on. But we just try to be very interactive as an organization. And because we have so many people that are a part of what we do, uh, it's about making those connections and connecting the dots for people. I'm going to go on Facebook, take that quiz, see how smart yeah. I am. Um, I think it's it might great. tell you a few things about yourself. You might learn a few things going like, oh, yeah, I do have to go see these guys. Yeah. And and it's hard for me, but I don't want to be afraid to take a quiz like that and see where I'm at. I, I, something like health is a simple example. If you're overweight, like very much so, it can be sometimes easy to tell. But sometimes you aren't overweight or you shouldn't be eating sugar or, you know, if you get into microbiome, certain foods just don't digest well in your body Mm -hmm. and you don't know until there's a major health concern that you have an issue. And I've ran into issues with just eating unhealthy for years and then suddenly, oh my gosh, my digestion is not what it used to be. We've seen scenarios like that more often. Maybe it's more common because you can look aesthetically at how a body looks, but it seems like vision, hearing, things like that is something that we might not realize um, is going by the wayside. So yeah, we're not going to make you do it. We're not going to make you do a self test on yourself about your hearing. So leave that to the professionals, but just, you know, normal things that people just don't think about, Mm. you know, like even just being in traffic, Hmm. you know, if you're, if you're walking and you're along a major roadway, you know, that's all doing damage, you know, and over time it just builds up and builds up. So I think once um, COVID lifts completely, I'm still going to be afraid to leave my house because this is the <laughs> the only controlled environment I have, Bob. Don't be afraid. We'll help you get through it. <laughs> um, I want to I want to move into business because I I do want to assume that a lot of the listeners are either stubborn like me most of my life, or they confidently don't have concerns. Even I'm sure someone in their family might. So it's good to be educated. But I want to talk about business because. 
you have a very decorated LinkedIn resume. I mean, I don't know you well, but I see, you know, you were, I, I don't know if I want to just let, I don't want to misrepresent you, but you were um, with the American Diabetes Situa- uh, Association, CEO at Gilda's Club, um, and way more than I can remember off the top of my head. So um, there's no time limit. I don't want you to feel rushed, but take us a little bit through your work history in Western New York, because it's you've done a lot for the community, to say the least, Bob. Yeah, and I, I've been fortunate. And, you know, I've said this before, people like I've I've never had to take a job just for the sake of it. Everywhere that I've had the fortune to work for are things that I'm passionate about. Mm. Um, and, and that's what gets me up every day. So early in my career, I started off in professional sports. And um, as I talk about my journey, I know, you know, like people will go like, well, how'd you get from here to here? But it, it'll yeah. all make sense by the time I got to get done and I'll, I'll keep it a bridge. But I started off working in professional sports. Uh, I was a kid that wanted to grow up and be a professional hockey player. I wanted to be the next Bobby Orr, the, the, you know, the great defenseman from the Boston Bruins. And uh, after I learned that that just wasn't going to be my path, um, I realized that I could still work in sports and in hockey on the administrative and on the business side of things. So uh, I worked for the Buffalo Sabres organization, started off here with the Rochester Americans uh, for three years and then worked up with the Buffalo Sabres for 10 years. And I did everything from marketing, sales, running hockey schools, learn to skate programs, promotions. Mm-hmm. Um, that that was so much fun because, again, that's where my passion was uh, since I was five years old and I first put on a pair of skates. Um, I then moved back to Rochester from there, and I was with the Rochester Rhinos uh, for their first, first four seasons, which was absolutely incredible yeah. uh, because we were starting a new franchise. We were bringing soccer back to Rochester for the first time in many years since the Rochester Lancers. And – because some of us that work for the organization came from major league sports, that was the mentality that we brought. And it wasn't about, we were trying to reach diehard soccer fans to come out to the games. We wanted it to be the event that everybody wanted to go to, whether they understood soccer or they didn't, it was about the events. And those first four years were just magical. Uh, you know, I say we, we used to fit 11,000 people into a 10,000 seat baseball stadium. Yeah. It was crazy, Uh, but we had a great ride through both of those jobs. The one thing that always was important to me was that community engagement. How do we get back to, you know, giving to the community? How do we work with younger populations? You know, whether it was teaching them how to play hockey or soccer, um, but it being more than just a sporting event. And I think that was one of the things that had made at the time the Rhino so successful was we really ingrained not just the organization, but our players doing community work so that they were able to get so in touch with the Rochester community. And, and, and all of a sudden they were treated like major league stars. Yeah. And it was amazing to see. Uh, from there, I went to Jiva Theater Center. I was the director of marketing communications uh, for six years. I then moved on as executive director for the Little Theater and the Film Society there, uh, which, again, my, my, my passions around movies and, and acting uh, really got to, to come in, into play with that. Um, but again, there was my first taste of not-for-profit work. And the most important thing for me was that, you know, with a lot of industries and, and not-for-profit at the time was like this, everybody kind of liked to work in a vacuum. Hmm. For me, it was about the partnerships. You know, who can we work with? So if I was at the Little and I wanted to bring in a program about, um, you know, the famous Paris Ballet Company, I was able to get in touch with the Rochester Ballet Company and say, hey, let's do something together. Or working with the Strong Museum, working with the RPO, because the sum of many is so much more impactful than just one voice. And I think that's where we were really trying to make sure that we were always giving back and educating people. It wasn't about coming to see a documentary. It was about that discussion we were having afterward to have that community dialogue and discussion. Um, I then went to Gilda's Club, uh, as you had mentioned, and uh, I actually started off as their development director. And shortly after I started, the CEO uh, announced her retirement and the board put enough of their trust into me 
uh, to be able to have me go there. And where Gilda's was so special was that, you know, it's not just for people going through cancer, but it's for their family members as well. And uh, I had lost both my parents to cancer. So I was a caregiver. And at the time, I wish I had known that Gilda's was there to help support me. So it was, again, being able to give back. Uh, I then spent four years as the executive director for the American Diabetes Association, where, again, it brought me back to, to my Buffalo roots because I, I ran offices in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and Albany. And this was another very personal choice for me because when I was 25, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And uh, then in October, I became so fortunate to be named president and CEO for Rochester Hearing Speech. So, you know, as I said, it's about the journey we all take. And for me, one thing led to another, led to another. And even making the transition from sports into entertainment, people say, well, what, what does a sports guy know about, yeah. you know, filling a theater? And I said, I know how to put people in seats. I know how to market something. And I know how to connect the community to the work that we're doing. And that's been that common thread throughout mm -hmm. all of my experiences that have really laid out that path for me of where do I go next? What's that next opportunity? And uh, I'm feeling pretty confident that this will be my final resting place. <laughs> Good to hear I'm still it. young, but I've got so much great work ahead of us uh, with our organization. So, Yeah, um, that's strong. The, the building community being the common thread. <laughs> being able to bring people on board as leaders, as team members, and as community members to come into the organization when you need help. That's that's something so many people are focused on metrics and they're focused on uh, the amount of impressions they get in marketing. But it sounds like you're more saying, let's look at what the community is going to endorse. Let's look at how we can help people be mission driven, be vision driven. And then the rest kind of almost doesn't matter what industry you're in with that mindset. It sounds like you've been very successful. Yeah, for me, it's always been about the quality and not mm. the quantity. Um, obviously, you know, if you're selling a ticket for something, you want to put as many people in there as possible. But like I said, it's then about that discussion afterward. And that was both live theater as well as, you know, the movie industry that we really put a focus on was, you know, there, there's some tough topics out there that are addressed through the arts. And I think that's one of the things that so many people are drawn to the arts for because it's entertaining, but it's also very thought provoking. We always wanted to be able to carry that discussion to the next level. So, you know, for me to be able to, you know, put together a Black History Month series of programs and not have those follow up discussions would have been an injustice to people um, because everybody wants to have a voice in something. And I think, you know, we're, we're so used to being yelled at by media or told through commercials what we need to be thinking. I want to be able to say, mm, I disagree with that, but here's why, and have that dialogue, have that discussion. And I think that's, again, for us, it's about, you know, they, they say it's a churn and burn, right? So you get as many people in and then you move them on. I want somebody to come in and if they're coming in to, to meet with one of my staff, I want them to have an hour to spend to talk about what their concerns are, what their fears, but also for us to be able to educate them you know, and help them to have a better understanding rather than being, you know, okay, get in the seat, get tested. We're going to fit you for hearing aid. Okay. Out the door. Next one comes in. That's not how, that's not how you successfully engage a community. And again, to me, that's the most, an as, most important aspect with everything is how do you engage people and have them talking about you to others because they mm -hmm. had such a great experience with it. You know, I, I think I kind of got lucky, Bob, but basically when you look at why I started this podcast, the couple main reasons were one, I'm a new business owner. I've never owned a business. Why don't I talk to business owners, decorated business people, influential people in the Rochester area and learn from them? And two, I want the people in the community to know that each other exists and try to create a network of people that support each other. And I didn't really have this conversation in my back pocket when I came <laughs> up with this idea. I almost feel like I got lucky. Uh, but that's why I want to ask you, Bob, because you look at your decorated history, it couldn't have been 
easy, or it seems like you're going bridge to bridge to bridge seamlessly. Any major challenges that you ran into that, you know, a business person, maybe they're going through now, or maybe they want to avoid that bump in the road. Any challenges that come to mind on your part that you, you would, maybe you wouldn't do it differently, but you sure wish you hadn't done it that way the first time. Oh, I mean, what day is it? Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's <laughs> let's, the every let's, day. We could do like a tw- 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and then COVID challenges. I think the, the, the first thing that I ever really learned, and, and this was a lesson from home, yeah. not even in business, but I've always carried it with me, you know, was my mother saying, you know, stop talking, listen, and take that all in and absorb it. Right. You don't have to have the answer to everything. You don't have to be the smartest kid in the sandbox, which I've always said I am not, but I'm smart enough to surround myself with other people, you know, to to really face those issues and learn from. Um, I've learned more from experiences that I wish I hadn't gone through than I did from ones where I say, oh, yeah, I did everything right. Mm. And it's all how you take it. there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they've got big egos. So if something doesn't go the way that they planned, it really knocks them down. For me, it was, let me use this as a learning experience. Let me try and also share this with others. So they have that opportunity to learn from. And I think, you know, along the way, yeah, there's been lots of times and and not even early in my career, Mm. you know, there's been times later in my career where I went like, I I know I would have handled that differently a year ago if I knew what I knew today. But it's also how you take those challenges and how you try to overcome them. And then what you do with that information, what you have, it, once you have it, I should say, um, so that I don't make that same mistake. But I'm not afraid to make mistakes. Hmm. God knows I've made plenty of them in my day. Um, and I also always share that with my team. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. There's very few things that you can do in one day that will shut our business down forever. But we have to learn from those mistakes. We have to go back and say, okay, how would we handle this differently? You know, if it happened again, or if it was a different scenario. And I think it, it's just, it's how people look at it. COVID obviously threw so many different curveballs to business owners <laughs> yeah. because I know I wasn't up on technology. Very seldom would I have ever been on a Zoom call or go to meeting. But boy, I'll tell you what, when things started happening, where we were like, this is going to be how we're going to have to communicate. We all started learning really quickly. It's also about if I don't know something, I will go to the person that I think will be able to help guide me through that and not be ashamed to say, I know I should know this, but I don't. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, that's not going to get me anywhere but deeper in a rut. So I think it's really just being open and, and, you know, it's about that collaboration and about that, that support network that we all put around ourselves to be able to say like, you know, Hey, Ben, I've never done a podcast before, but what would I have to look at doing something like that for our agency? I don't want to look it up online. I want to be able to talk to somebody directly and hear about that experience and to see if it's something that might be for me and maybe it's not. And I'll also learn that. So that, that's really, for me, the biggest thing is learning from those times where now I look back and I really kind of cringe like, oh, I can't believe I handled it that way. Or I said that yeah. I got through that. And, and, and part of that is because I've always been fortunate to have enough people around me to say, hey, guess what? That's OK. Don't let it get you down. Learn from it and be able to move on. You've said so many, this is a, the thing about having a podcast is I get to hear it, but I don't take notes because I try to be present. So I'm going to record a re I'm basically going to rewind the past 10 minutes and take notes when I'm <laughs> listening to this. Anyone listening should as well. You've said so many great things from don't be afraid to make mistakes, to ask good questions and actually listen to the answer and collaborate with people, create a dialogue. I I can't attribute the person because I forget who said it, but um, it's basically an analogy and it, it's not this black and white. I know there's different scenarios, Bob, but let's say I'm your employee and I took a risk. I made a mistake. 
and I lost the company $2,000. What happens? Do you fire me? No. And now I challenge you. How are we going to make that $2,000 <laughs> up? Because here's the thing. When you take a risk like that, yeah. and I, you know, my, my team knows, like, I'm like, look, I, I love trying different things. And that's knowing that half of it can really pay off and the other half won't pay off as long as we mitigate what that risk is. Hmm. But that $2,000 you lost could have been $6,000 that would have been gained. You don't know until you try things, you know, and, and really it's about, and, and part of this is around, you know, just the environment that we're all in right now after the last year. But, you know, the way that I put it to my team is, you know, how do we disrupt the norm? How do we take those things that we're used to doing a certain way every day and we've done them like this for 10 years and say, okay, let's take that box and let's turn it over. Let's look underneath it. Let's spin it around a little bit. How can we make ourselves more efficient? How do we make ourselves more effective? And ultimately, what are the needs of the people that we're serving? And how does this help us to be able to do that? Because we might think we have the only way to do it. You know that we don't. You yeah. Know? So it's that that's where risk taste taking comes in. And that's what's going to help to set companies apart, you know, moving forward. I mean, you know, we can use Eastman Kodak as a perfect example, right? They held the first patent for a digital camera, but they were afraid to do anything with it because they didn't want it to hurt their film business, which was their core bread and butter. Right. Well, where's Kodak now? You know, and then you look at a company like App. Apple is constantly reinventing, but they're reinventing based on what they foresee as being the things that their consumers want to have and need to have. And now when you have people that are going out saying, oh, I just spent 1700 bucks on that new iPhone because I had to have it. Mm -hmm. That's building a culture. So you constantly have to be willing to change. Um, I think the, the other thing that COVID really uh, was an eye opener for a lot of companies where people had had a, a three or a five year plan and that got blown up. Yeah. Well, no, but we got to stick to the plan. No, we don't. Yeah. We stick to the core of the plan, but how we get there has to change. And you have to be willing, again, to take some risks, take some chances to do those things. And that's how you end up giving longevity and being successful. Yeah, take a chance, disrupt the norm. And then if you can build a community, Apple is the best example anyone could ever mention because they've built a community of advocates that literally bleed their product to the point that the big trending thing now is um, Clubhouse and Clubhouse isn't available on Android. And someone like me that has a podcast and likes blogging and ever is literally right. pulling, pulling my hair out because I can't get on Clubhouse on my Android phone. And that's really building a community, disrupting a norm. Yeah. Um, I love the digression because it was probably the best answer anyone could give. Cause the the answer, in my opinion, to that question, you know, two thousand dollars, do you fire the guy? Um, the analogy is no, I just paid two thousand dollars towards your training. Like you make a mistake yep. like that. If you just turn someone over for taking a risk, as long as they learned what went wrong, you're paying for their training in that regard. And I loved your response that let's figure out a way to make that money back. Because if, yeah. if, if you lose me too, but you can make me nine and be a valuable member of my team, that's way more valuable than that too. It's and it's also for the person itself, right? Because what you don't want to have happen is somebody somebody tries something. If it doesn't work, all of a sudden they've got their tail between their legs, mm. they're feeling down in the dumps. Mm. And, and that's why I try to turn it. Okay, so now what do we do to make that back, right? Because now it's okay, you've got to get back into the game mentally. You know, we 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 were down five goals going into the third period, but miraculously, we ended up winning the game. Why? Because people learned from something and they wanted to keep trying to come out of that hole. And yeah. I think that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's too easy, especially for, for managers and leaders to, to, you know, point their finger at somebody and say, you know, you did bad on that. You did a bad job. You don't want to lose somebody mentally. You need to bring them back into that game and get them back on that horse as quickly as possible. And, and that's the best way to do it by not saying, okay, well, now I'm going to go and take care of this problem. Mm. No. 
we're going to figure this out together. I need you to be an active participant in this. Now let's, let's figure this out. So Rochester, I love it. Born and raised could name 500,000 things I love about it. <laughs> let's talk about, you know, one thing that you really like about Rochester, but then one problem or challenge that ultimately we need to start collaborating. It's not all going to be solved on this podcast, but any challenges that you've seen in Rochester, you know, being a business person in Rochester for so long? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I always said, you know, I'll, I'll preface this Ben by saying I, I was the kid that was like, when I grow up, I can't wait to get out of Rochester. Sure. And then I'm the guy that went, no, Rochester's pretty darn good and, and came back. Um, I think we've enjoyed being a hidden gem as a city. Uh, we've enjoyed kind of being the underdog. You know, we're, you know, always behind Buffalo, which was bigger and had major league sports. And But I think part of that thinking is, yeah, we, we still think kind of small. Now, we've tried some bigger things over the years, like the Fast Ferry, you know, that just, it didn't work, right? That, that was a one-way trip. That was great for people that want to go from Rochester to Toronto, but there wasn't much bringing people back here. So I think that's one of the challenges that the city has seen is really where's our place. Um, there's been a lot of things that we've been able to do to start trying to build off of that. And I think, you know, the arts is one area. Um, you know, we've got world-class arts organizations and artists here in town. Uh, but I think there's still that feeling that even though we used to be the corporate giant of Kodak and Xerox and Bausch and Lomb, um, that, that we lost that when they all started moving out. But right now what I see is we're, we're, we're a groundswell. So out of all those lost jobs at those companies, how many smaller tech firms started to grow? And what's out there that's happening in this city that the people that live and work here aren't even aware of yet? And I think that's a big part of where we can, you know, grow as a city is to really to be able to make sure that people are aware of groundbreaking work that's happening in this city and how they can be a part of that and be proud of it um, to be able to, you know, retain talent when it comes to Rochester, retain students that are coming here to go to school. And then instead of sending them off mm. somewhere else with their education and their experience, how do we keep them here? Because, you know, I'll say, I, I've got a lot of friends that have lived in larger cities that have come back to Rochester. And the first thing they say is, great place to raise a family. It's affordable. We, we, we thoroughly enjoy all four seasons, as we were talking about at the start of this, where yeah. even we're enjoying winter while we're in spring. Um, mm -hmm. But there's just so much talent. And there's so much work that's being done to uh, affect not only our country, but the world with what's coming out of this city um, that I think, you know, for us to be able to do a better job of everybody being proud of them and everybody being able to feel like, you know what, this is what my city is making happen uh, in these different industries is, is a big part of that. And, and that it's also a city where your dreams can come true, especially as a, as a business owner, you know, you open a new business, there's so much opportunity out there to be able to, you know, tap in and, and create relationships. Um, I don't see this as a big, you know, dog eat dog city uh, where competitors are, you know, mm -hmm. I know a lot of industries where the competitors are working together yeah. because everybody's got their own niche. So it's like, okay, how can we build on that, make that even broader and bigger? I know in the music and entertainment industry, that's absolutely true. And I love the, I love the realistic optimism. I, Bob, did you ever thought about running for mayor? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I would not want that job. I feel like no. that's the, the sentiment of a lot of the most qualified people. Yeah. I, I'd rather be a couple rows behind. Okay. Helping to push people forward that would be, you know, better for roles like that. I'm, I'm always about, you know, I, I learned this from an early age. Like, you know, you think about the, the corporate pyramid and everybody goes, oh, you know, want to be at the top of the pyramid, right? The CEO. And, you know, even, even with my team now, you know, I told them right off the bat, I said, I'm not sitting up there. Mm -hmm. I'm at the bottom. I like being able to help push people forward, help you to learn how to grow. 
and, and learning from that as well. And I, I think that's the one thing that, you know, we have is we have such amazing leaders in this country or in this um, city and county for business and for civic work that we all can learn and we can all help push everybody together. Because you, you, you just can't have 5% of the people sitting there being able to do all the work and have the vision. Mm. It's got to be everybody working together. I love the the pyramid analogy being at the bottom. What's coming to mind for me, and it, it's a uh, analogy, it's not literal, but if you're the biggest and take the most space and do the most work, if you have the largest stake in the game, if you're at the top of the pyramid, all that space is right up there at the top. But if you have people that are taking up that much space, holding up that much weight and pressure at the bottom, exactly, those are the people holding up the rest of the pyramid. Yeah, I, I'm stealing that one, Bob. I like hey. that. Hey, I was never I was never the nimble one who could get to the top of the human pyramid. <laughs> yeah. I was always the husky kid. So my my place was at the bottom. And, and I'm totally comfortable with that. I yeah. like being a part of the foundation for places. And, and that's why, you know, everywhere I've been fortunate enough to lead and work, it's been about how do we build this up? And, and ultimately, who's at the top are the people that we serve. They're the ones that we want up there. We want to be able to push them forward and be able to hold them up. So yeah, servant leadership. Absolutely. Bob, we could do 10 of these, or at least I could <laughs> on my end. But for the sake of time, I want to move to the rapid fire round. Easy, short, either Are you sure or. Easy? <laughs> fill in, you can even fill in the blanks. So it's just okay. short answer questions. We'll get started with coffee or tea. Oh, coffee all the way. What about uh, beer or wine or water? Uh, can I say whiskey? Yeah. And here's why, you know, having diabetes, wine and beer have too many carbs. Whiskey has zero carbs. There so, you go. So, you know, I, I, when I do drink, which isn't often, I drink for my health. Hmm. It's honestly, it's a good mentality. You know, everything in moderation, balance. I, I love whiskey. I stopped drinking because I was not good at moderation, but that's beside the point. Um, what about cats or dogs? Are you an animal person? Well, I'll say, so I'm allergic to animals since I was a child. So we never grew up with any, but, uh, but I live with a mini schnauzer right now uh, that when my girlfriend and I moved in together and, and he has my heart, he's my buddy. So uh, I'm going to say dogs. Love it. What about iOS or Android? Are you an Apple guy? I have Apple everything except my phone. Three years ago, I switched over to, to a galaxy because I was like, I, I I felt like I, I was, everything was too easy by having, you know, an iMac, an iPad. I used to have an iPod, you know, I, I wanted just to like take myself out of the comfort zone, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm probably going to be going back to it in a couple of years. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. I, I like people that have tried. I know people that have had Apple products since they were eight, nine, 10 years old and that they're yeah they're well there weren't really apple products around when i was that age i'm giving sure. my age away so but but the thing is why you know why do people buy them because they're really good quality and it's nice when they can talk to each other yeah and and you're not giving your age away because this technology thing's been around so i'm kind of giving my age away like i was you know under a teenager when this start stuff started coming out and just blows my mind that we're in the 2020s now and the amount we've grown technologically wise, you've mentioned Rochester growing as a tech community so rapidly in the past five, 10 years blows my mind. Yeah. It's a lot different than, uh, you know, like we, we had the original Pong machine when I was a kid and we thought that was the greatest thing ever invented, you know, because you could turn a dial. Pong is long past the time <laughs> Yeah, I, I haven't played Pong in virtually ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else? I guess at the end of the day, I mean, you're you're a wealth of knowledge. I appreciate you coming on. I want to squeeze out just a little bit more juice and just one final tip um, to close out today. Anything that we should have touched on that maybe a listener would have asked that I forgot to. 
Uh, no, first, thank you for having me. I mean, your questions have been great. And, you know, like I said, this has just been a great dialogue to be able to have. Uh, I, I, I love being able to do this. I say one final tip is for people to make sure that every day they're bringing their passion to what they do. And it's so important that, you know, no matter what it is that your job is, that you find something in it that really makes you want to get up in the morning to do it and that you're giving it your very best. We all have bad days, but making sure that we're able to the next day remember why we're doing it. And um, for me, my, my happiness and my life depends on being able to do that. And, and this was actually a discussion I had yesterday with my leadership team was, you know, we, we get going in a million different directions. Take that few minutes to realize the impact that we're having for people. Mm-hmm. And, and I literally had two things happen. One was through a text that I received from, you know, one of the, the, the clients that we have. And the other one's watching a video of uh, a group of our children going on a field trip the other day to Highland Park and meeting up with a fireman and looking at their faces. And it made me take two minutes just to sit back and go, okay, this is why I'm doing this. This is what we're doing and how we're making an impact for people. So that's the thing. We're, we all don't like going to work every day, but if you can't find something that drives you with that, it might be time to look for another career. Absolutely. I've been joking. I work half days. And it's not half days because I love to work. It's half days because I'm working half the day. So choose <laughs> choose tw- choose 12 hours and that's what I'm working. But at the end of the day, yeah, it's because I love doing it. I, I said this before we hit record. I'm tired today. I don't feel well. But having conversations like uh, with people like you, it makes it all worthwhile. And it, it's part of why I love what I do. Thank you again, Bob, for coming yeah, on. Absolutely. Can I learn from... I'm learning from you too, Ben. I, I need you to know that this is a two-way street. So, you know, thanks so much for just, you know, our, our past conversations. And I know that you and I are going to be connected for quite a while um, because I really love the work that you're doing and uh, the synergies that I think that, you know, we have as just people and individuals. Agreed, Bob. Tell, tell us one more time how to keep uh, in, in touch with you and ultimately everything you do. RHSC. So it's Rochester Hearing Speech Center.org. And everything's right there. Uh, you can even click on a link to send me an email directly. And uh, I love hearing from people. So any way that we can help as you know, an individual agency, that, that's what we're here for. Thanks for coming on again, Bob. It's been fun. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to Rochester Business Connections. Don't forget to share this, rate, and comment on your favorite platform. You can also email me, ben at balbertmarketing.com. Let's connect soon. Until then, keep thriving, everyone.